are accomplished when you pull together a diverse group of perspectives. And that, again, goes to this cross-disciplinary nature of data science. Um, the Data Science Institute has a, an 11-month professional Master of Science in Data Science program. And we partner across the University of Virginia with all of the schools um, to talk about solving really large questions, answering really big problems. Um, and um, we have recently partnered with the Darden School of Business to offer a dual degree where the students actually receive an MBA and a Master of, data, Master of Science in Data Science degree in two years. Um, we're always looking for additional partnerships and through our programs we offer um, all kinds of research projects, both student-based and faculty-based, where again, we are addressing some of these large, large challenges across a variety of domains. Um, we, uh, the UVA has um, a booth in the, um, a couple booths actually over in the exhibit hall, so we welcome you to come, come see us talk about how you can partner with UVA um, and the Data Science Institute um, to answer some of these exciting, exciting challenges. We are really excited to be a part of this. Um, this is what we do. The University Challenge is all about bringing these people together. So it's, um, it's our pleasure to be sponsoring um, the University Challenge. And without further ado, because you're not here to listen to me, um, I would like to introduce um, the first team. So to kick off our presentation, I would like um, everyone to please welcome the team from the George Washington University for their presentation addressing the issue of veteran suicide. Veterans Affairs Healthcare Benefits. And 
to what ReachMet is doing is it's reaching those six million. So then you see that question right there up to the red line. What are we doing about those 10 to 14 million? And that's what we're going to focus our solutions in our analysis on a little bit more, is trying to figure out how we can identify, how we can reach out to, and how we can help those who are already getting help from the VA. So just a little bit about our data set. Um, like it was mentioned before, it was surprisingly difficult to try and find a large amount of decent data on um, veterans. But we were able to take resources from them, Veterans Affairs, um, government spending, and compile our own data set from 2014 that included variables such as veteran population, veteran suicide rate, um, general civilian suicide rate, VHA facilities, grant funding, and more. And so one of the things that's astonishing is that veterans account for just about, in 2014, 8.5% of the population, but also for about almost one-fifth of the total U.S. suicides, which is an unfortunately astonishing rate. We also noticed that in 2016, if you look at this map here, it's a map of all the states and their utilization of um, veterans in, or utilization of VA benefits. So the highest state VA benefit usage was Alaska at 64%. The lowest was New Jersey at just about 38%. So all of those blue states, their veterans are only using, a, only about 50% of their veterans are using the VA, which is an issue. It's something that we really want to help address. So taking a deeper dive into our 2014 data set, there's a few things that stood out to us. For one, one of the issues is trying to identify locations and veterans who are at risk. We found that, as you can see on that top, that first column right there, for all suicide rates, veteran suicide rate is correlating about 90% with all suicide rates. So when you're trying to identify what veterans are most at risk, you actually should look at states in general that have a high suicide rate and start pinpointing there. The next thing we're going to do is look at the second column here, which is veteran suicide rate. And this is where things get really interesting because it's, I think, where we can really dive deep into trying to help veterans. So one of the, one of the highest correlations is veteran population compared to veteran suicide rate. Now, when I first thought about it, I was a little bit confused. Why were higher veteran population rates correlating to lower suicide rates? Because one would think, oh, if you have more veterans, you have more suicides. But then it started all making sense. It's all about community. So all VHA, the number of VHA facilities per state, the number of veterans per state, and the grant funding for veterans per state all contribute to lower suicide rates. And it all has to do with having a larger community. The more grant funding you have, the more veteran facilities you, you can uh, put up. The more veterans are, there's more of a community to really reach out to veterans and have them um, have people who can relate to them. So then what we have here is just a little state-by-state -state comparison, which I thought was really interesting. On the left is the veteran suicide rate, and on the right is the grant funding for state in the millions. And there's a little bit of a trend on the veteran suicide rate. The more westward you go, the higher the suicide rate. But these, these few outliers, like California and Texas, which in the sea of red, tend to be pretty blue, and same thing with Washington State. And what we, see, what we noticed was it's not perfect. But for the states like Texas and California and Washington, they also tend to have a little bit of higher grant funding towards them. So if we're able to push more grant funding to states like Montana and have a better community, be able to build more facilities with that grant money, you can actually try and lower some of that veteran suicide rates per state. And then Eric's gonna take over. Thank you, Heather. So when we talk about where the veterans are located, what can the VA do to target veterans who are not associated with the veteran affairs officially? And one method we thought of was to use Twitter and social media. So what I did was I used the hashtag veteran, and this is from some last Sunday. Just one day, 127 tweets reached over 560,000 impressions. And if you look a little bit deeper, one person caused 87,000 of those impressions via retweet uh, tactics. So what does that mean for the Veterans Affairs? Well, they can, use, they can use a hashtag campaigns or tactics or influencers to reach veterans who are not officially in their care, but they can communicate with them through the way they would communicate with veterans who were in their care. And if you think about it, if you use the War Cloud Association, did this for hashtag veteran, hashtag veteran, and suicide, you can see what words are associated with them. And what we found was community-based interests 
for a veteran, such as looking for a new job, some hobbies they had. And if you look at, if you take this down to the state level, you can create state level Twitter tactics as well. Uh, something I learned, I didn't know about when I did hashtag veteran suicide, is something called hashtag SPSM. Uh, I wasn't familiar with this, but apparently it stands for suicide prevention and social media. So there's already existing campaigns out there that are addressing the needs that the veterans are looking for. And it'd be great if the veterans could partner with the existing community-based campaigns using social media to target one of the 14 million veterans that they don't officially communicate with. So let's take a look at the Veterans Affairs Twitter itself. So they have about 680,000 followers. We mapped where their followers are in the United States. They're across the United, they're across the country. Uh, they're more aggregated in the Northeast, but that has to do with population density. So they, they have a far-reaching impact among, among the country. And then what we also, next to we we'll look at their tweets themselves, and we can analyze how many of their tweets got retweeted, right? And it averaged about 50 retweets per tweet, but there are certain times when it's, much higher, the variance is higher. And that happened during the Veterans Day Marine Corps birthday. Marine Corps birthday is November 10th. Any Marines in the room? Maybe not today. Mm -hmm. Oh, we got one summer by. And then November 11th is Veterans Day. So if you know those are going to be your highest visibility days here at the department, you can possibly utilize social campaign uh, tactics. And then our third bullet, we compared their Twitter followers to the other executive branch agencies to see where they stand and also they can leverage best practices across government. So we came to the final slide, we took, like, we took a look at where the veterans are in terms of where the VA system or not in the VA system, and it comes down to the bumper sticker we have there. It's interconnected and interdependent, especially in analytics around if you have higher community-based attributes and you take it into allocation of grant funding, you create better outcomes for the population. Now, if I don't know about the grant funding, uh, the VA has about $160 million budget. The funding comes from the VA budget itself in the forms of grants. And they have about a, about a billion dollars grant to give out to the communities, to the different medical centers. And they have a lot of freedom on how to spend it. So one of the suggestions we have is also you can allocate the funding in different ways to increase the outcome. Yeah, and so what's we kind of realized at the end of this is it's not so much about trying to pinpoint exactly at this better, trying to predictably, you know, figure out, all right, you have this system, this characteristic, so we should try and reach out to you. We realize it's more of a state level, kind of a whole country level, where you need to look at states, for example, like we're showing, that have maybe higher suicide rates among veterans and use that to build better communities all together instead of just singleizing people individually, building a better community in general around veterans. Well, that's our presentation and we want to thank you for listening and we're very, we're very happy to do this. We have to thank our advisors. We <laughs> uh, <laughs> Brian and Sarah. Question. Um, you showed in the following, in the map of the Twitter followers, they were very heavily concentrating in the Northeast. Did you have any kind of idea of correlation of the, the follower, density of followers in some of the other states with higher incidence <coughs> of, uh, of suicide, high risk, 40 percent? Yeah, that's a good question. We looked at the aggregation of followers per state, and it seemed to be in line with correlation that had shown with the suicide rate. Yeah, so like on the map that we had, a lot of the northeastern states were that little bit of a lighter blue color for better suicide rate. That was also where the population density of um, followers were for the VA Twitter. Uh, just another quick question. So when you were showing uh, grant spend, um, things like that, did you think about looking at grant spend per bed? Um, as a lot of the grant spend was in high population areas, but creating you know new features of 
let's look at the grants spend per veteran and see what those were uh, versus just the straight grant spend per state. We thought about looking at that. Um, however, kind of what our theory was, if grant spending per vet is important, but if you're gonna build facilities and you're gonna you know, spend a lot of money on having VHA facilities, um, we figured that the better indicator of that would be the grant funding in total compared to just grants funding per veteran. I agree with exactly what Heather said. The grant funding comes in a lot of different methods as a delivery. So if you look at just vets, grant spending for veterans, that could show some correlations that might not agree, such as uh, like employment opportunities that are coming from those grants may include veteran employment or veteran spouse employment that wouldn't be necessarily displayed correctly if you put it down to the per vet level. Thank you everyone so much for listening to our presentation and we hope you enjoyed it. to the team from the George Washington University. And now, without any bias from the introducer, I'd like to invite the team from the University of Virginia to come up and give their presentation. at UVA, it's my colleague Bo, she's a third year. We are team Eon from UVA and this is our presentation. So before we go into the project, I kind of wanted to roadmap where we're starting and what our final deliverables would be. So the first aspect of the project was data collection. What we were kind of hoping for, what we wanted to do was get a data that would show a range of variables and really identify a new thing that has occurred in the last 15 to 20 years. So as you can see on the graph on the left, the veteran suicide rate really spiked in 2004 compared to the general population suicide rate, and we want to see like why this was and how we should tackle the issue differently. The second aspect of our project was data analysis. So what was important about this is we wanted to identify trends and correlations among the variables that we found in the first step. What we kind of looked at was Twitter sentiment, uh, firearm regulation, and different things like that. Now the final part of our project, kind of what, what this all means, is like what, how we deliver and what, what policy we can recommend for the future. So how do we really tackle the issue of what, what does this mean for Congress and other, other agencies that are looking to kind of figure out what's going on? So just for a general overview of how the veteran demographics are, uh, there's approximately 19 million veterans in the United States, majority are male, majority are Caucasian, 44% um, of veterans are ages 65 or older. As you can see in the heat map on the right, uh, there's large demographics of veterans in Florida, California, and Texas. So after we had this general overview, we wanted to see more of what the graph on the first slide represented, and we looked at how the veteran suicide rate compares to the general suicide rate. So the first thing you'll notice is that it's almost double in every case in the general suicide rate, and, but, and for females, it's triple that. So clearly this is a different, it's, it's a similar issue, but we have to tackle it differently because it's so much more prevalent. You can't use the same approaches. We have to scale it up, and when you, come, when you scale it, there's issues that arise, and you have to account for those. So you can see the trends among general suicide and veteran suicide the race are very similar. And showing the heat map on the right again, you can see states such as Nevada and Montana, the darker they are, they have the higher suicide rate, which we'll go into later. Because these were, there was a range of factors. We really want to tackle like why it's so prevalent here and what we can do to really figure that out. So we gathered data for the suicide rate among veterans for each state from 2014, as well as the characteristics of veterans for each state. Um, some of the variables included in our data set were median income, education level, and the percentage of veterans serving in each war. After running a correlation analysis, we found that the percentage of veterans who do not have insurance has a moderate correlation with the suicide rate. Almost two million veterans do not have health insurance. In addition to that, 42% are not aware of the VA health benefits that are available to them. 
Access to VA healthcare is also limited by the complicated priority system that is determined by disability and income. Moreover, over 40,000 veterans with PTSD are not diagnosed each year. Since PTSD is a service-connected disability, this puts them in a lower priority group and prevents them from getting the mental health care that they need. We know that social isolation is a huge factor in suicide, and our data shows that the percentage of veterans living in rural areas has a moderate correlation with the suicide rate. However, you can see that there are a few states with low percentages of veterans living in rural areas, but very high, percent, high rates of suicide. These states are Utah, Arizona, New Mexico, and Nevada. So what other factors besides social isolation could be causing these high suicide rates? We found that what differentiates these four states from the others is firearm regulation. On average, each state has around 26 firearm laws. However, each of these states have less than half of the firearm laws for the average in the United States. What really stood out to us was the lack of background check, fire regulation, and dealer regulation. Darker colors on the map on top indicate higher suicide rates among veterans, and darker colors at the bottom indicate more lenient firearm regulation. As you can see, states with more lenient firearm regulation tend to have higher suicide rates among veterans. Now we can address what we saw in the earlier slide. Montana barely has any firearm regulation and the highest rate of suicide among veterans. Okay, so kind of going to the next aspect of the project was the social media. So we started with LinkedIn. We wanted to look at LinkedIn because one, as part of the onboarding, onboarding process when you recruit a veteran, you're um, recommended to make a LinkedIn account. And two, we thought the data would be very useful. So things like how long veterans have been working certain jobs, where they're being employed, how, what kind of field they're going into. But the issue was with LinkedIn, none of the data is private, or none of the data is public. So for the scope of our project, um, it wasn't really viable. But in the future, it's definitely an avenue that we think we would be interested in exploring and other teams should explore. So the next thing we looked at was Facebook. So with Facebook, we found that we could identify veterans with 50% success rate. However, the only really useful information from Facebook was the location. There were better ways to do that. So finally, we looked at Twitter. We found uh, with our algorithm, we could identify veterans with a 90% success rate. So we've been running this algorithm for about two weeks, two to three weeks, and we've identified over 40,000 veterans, and these impressions have reached over 100,000 of their tweets. So the interesting thing is we can pull a lot of information from this data, and it's really cool like how we can show this. So uh, to kind of walk through what we did with this, I'll go to the next slide. So we started with a real-time incoming tweet feed, and from this, we filtered out uh, possible Twitter accounts for veterans by keyword. We had about 6,700 revisions before we were able to hit this 90% success rate. So we, um, after the, we had the keywords, we pulled the user bio information, and from this, we could pull, pull different information, where they're from, what they're tweeting about. So the first thing we did was we pulled location. So with this location, we did a heat sector analysis, and we plotted this on a heat map, and we, we kind of saw where veterans are tweeting from and how this compares to the general demographics. So the interesting thing about this and where it differs from the current data sets is from Twitter, you can even go down to the county level. You can go down to uh, city by city and find out where, where things are going on. Another aspect is um, kind of like if there's a lot of veterans tweeting about hospitals in this area, you can use that information. So the second thing we did with all this data is we did a uh, sentiment analysis on the tweets from the veterans. So we scaled it from negative 100 to 100, negative 100 being negative, 100 being positive, and we saw um, two things. So what, what the keywords are veterans are tweeting about and how they're tweeting about it. So whether they, if they're tweeting about um, healthcare services, do they like that, do they not like that, what are they, what are they, what are they talking about, is there a new law that got passed, what, what is affecting veterans. So you can have a better understanding without directly having to communicate with them of what's going on. So in the map that on the screen right now, in our in, produced from our demo, we have a um, sentiment analysis of the tweets from all of our data. So as you can see, states just in Montana have the most negative Twitter sentiment. So again, this is another factor that goes into why Montana has the highest suicide rate. You can kind of use this to dive into. So in the real demo, which we'll be doing in the exhibit hall, we welcome you to check that out. If you hover over the state, you can see the keywords. So say they're tweeting about like there's a lack of facilities, then you can instantly know that this is an issue and this is what you should tackle. So the next thing we did was we plotted a heat map of the veterans, the veteran Twitter population on uh, state by state. And again, what I was talking about, you can go by, you can go by county, you can go by city, you can really break it down and see like, okay, the state might be good, but we didn't recognize that this one county is doing really bad, so we have to fix that. So it really shows you. 
And then you're all probably wondering, like, how does it compare to the real demographics? And we found that it was um, extremely similar. So on the map now, this is the actual better demographics. So it kind of shows that our data is, the Twitter data we, that we collected is representative of the actual veteran population. So after we did all this, the, the important thing was, like, what does this mean for policy and where we can take this in the future? So we took this, we took two aspects. One, obviously using our data, but the second aspect was what's, ha what's occurred in the last 15, 20 years, where this succeeded, where does this fail, and how we can incorporate that with the data to kind of pull, pull new solutions. So the first aspect was having VA resources complement private healthcare. So as my partner mentioned, in areas of social isolation, you can't just go build hospitals, you can't build VA resources, that's intensive, it takes time. But you can have private healthcare systems that are already established complement the VA resources and increase access. So as everything is mentioned, there's there's over like there's a significant portion of veterans that aren't utilizing resources. So this kind of to offset that and really improve care. Uh, to give one example, in 2014, the VA Choice Program I sought to do this, but the issue was with that there were still wait times over 30 days. So it was a start in the right direction, but it really didn't improve upon. The second aspect is um, limiting firearm uh, ownership and re increasing regulation for um, those that have depend on their mental health status. So in 2010, 2011. There was two bills that were introduced to require mental health screenings um, once one becomes a veteran. So we think this should be implemented and um, required all veterans because instead of having them knowing when they think they have a problem, which sometimes is too late, they're getting checked up regularly. And if there are issues, if there are things that should be um, brought up and are concerns, we can have that addressed before they're, before it gets worse. The third aspect, well, it's kind of a community-centered approach on content creation. So again, like areas like such as Montana or other areas where there aren't VA resources and there's a social, high social isolation, you can have family and friends have the knowledge needed of, okay, if, if, if they know a veteran, if they're exhibiting PTSD conditions or depression symptoms, you can kind of target that before and put them in contact with the resources. So this is kind of to offset again. You can't always build resources instantly. It takes time, it takes money. But this kind of offsets like, okay, I recognize there is an issue and now I know when to get help instead of kind of, oh, help is too far. So it, it's, it kind of offsets that. Now the last aspect was using social media, so the things we had from Twitter, and identifying at-risk veterans. So this goes into like, say veterans are tweeting a lot negatively about something, you can kind of use this Twitter, you can find their location, you can find their uh, account, and then you can even tweet back at them, like, hey, you have X, Y, Z resources. So really the thing about this is that um, when, when there are issues with at-risk veterans, you're not waiting until the last minute. You can use this data to kind of show, okay, we should target these issues first. And you know, you know your resources have been used efficiently instead of kind of playing guess and check and saying what works is later. So thank you for your time. We'll now invite the rest of our team. We'll take any questions. So there's a quick question about the um, Facebook and the Twitter mm -hmm. uh, angles that you took there. You mentioned that with Facebook, you, you were able to find some information, but primarily it was around location, and you thought that it would be uh, easier to find that elsewhere. Um, my, my question is, where elsewhere do you think would be better to find that location? Did you do any analysis of better engagement with Facebook versus Twitter? Do you, do you know if uh, they, they kind of correlate? Is there more on one or the other? Um, so for Facebook, we did look into how uh, the accounts may connect to the Twitter. Uh, so our success rate with, with that was about 20%. And we tried to pull Twitter bios and like Twitter accounts from the Facebook. Uh, this was not very successful because, again, the Facebook API is quite restricted as compared to the Twitter API. So that's why we decided to stick with Twitter. Great, thank you so much um, to the University of Virginia team. Um, next up, we have the team from George Mason University, so please welcome. We were asked to take a look at the uh, issue of veteran suicide uh, 
uh, as it relates uh, to uh, potential data analytics solutions. So we've heard some of the epidemiology of the problem already this morning. The main takeaway from this is that the general population that uh, suicide rate is about one third that of veterans. That's a pretty big difference, and so we wanted to try to find the differences between the veteran population and the general population. This is a really difficult problem to address. There are a couple of reasons for this. One was that the best source of data on veterans is from the Veterans Health Administration. However, it's uh, well established that only about 70% of uh, veterans who commit suicide have not received care from the Veterans Health Administration in the previous 12 months. So there's a really important open question, which is uh, how uh, extensible are the results from the VHA population going to be to the general population of veterans? It's really difficult to obtain data on suicide in general. It's really difficult to conduct research. It's really difficult to interview um, people who've um, committed suicide. It's impossible. So uh, research is really difficult. And the other problem is that any um, recommendation that you make uh, can become really difficult to implement. So suicide, it turns out, is a really impulsive act. And so uh, in a small study of near uh, lethal suicides, uh, the, uh, about 24% of them, uh, from the time they decided to commit suicide to actually making the attempt took less than five minutes. And that number goes up to 70% for less than an hour. So the window that you have to act if you wait for someone to become suicidal is very narrow. This means that we either have to identify uh, people before they become suicidal, or we have to make population level interventions to reduce the suicide rate overall. We had quite a few sources that we used. One of the biggest ones is that the uh, Department of Veterans Affairs has made a very large synthetic data set available. It's about uh, 1.8 gigabytes, has about 1 million records. Uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Obviously, we used uh, data sources uh, on uh, published data from a variety of government and non-governmental sources. And uh, we tried to really limit the assumptions that we made. Obviously, in any sort of data analysis, you have to make a lot of assumptions. But our biggest one is that our core assumption was that the population of veterans is different than the population of the general population. So we really tried to avoid making uh, ecological inference fallacies by assuming that things that were true about the general population were necessarily true about veterans. So we were very careful about those assumptions. We tried to avoid them when possible. We tried to limit ourselves when we could to statistics that were particular to veterans. So to talk about the uh, Veterans Affairs synthetic data set for just a moment, uh, these two uh, plots uh, illustrate some of the challenges in working with this data set. So the plot that you see on the left is a scatter plot, and it shows two variables that we expect to be very highly correlated. So on the horizontal axis, it shows cumulative days of VA use during the past three months. And uh, on the vertical axis, it shows that same statistic, but over a six month period. We expected those uh, statistics to be highly correlated. We also expected one to always be bigger than the other. That wasn't the case, there was no functional relationship. We investigate this for all of the variables in the data set. This has about 470 variables, and we found that the largest off diagonal correlation is about 0.02. So there's no correlation among any of the variables, even ones you'd expect to be highly correlated. Another problem that we found was that uh, in the method of synthesis, that uh, a lot of variables that you would expect to be uh, have distributions other than normal were normally distributed in the um, data set. So the horizontal line represents zero. This is the same uh, variable we just showed, the cumulative data is of uh, VHA use in the previous three months. Uh, that's a count. It should always be at least zero. We found that about 40% of the values in the data set were less than zero. So uh, <clears throat> this was a real challenge. Uh, we were able to uh, contact the VA about the data set and they were able to confirm that the uh, independent variables were not independently just, uh, generated. So the, the takeaway from this is that uh, anyone who works with machine learning knows that uh, having training data is really important. Synthetic data is something that you need some sort of machine learning, uh, especially in a healthcare setting where privacy is really important, and doing synthetic data is a really hard problem. So VA isn't alone in this problem. I think a lot of uh, companies are having the same sorts of problems. Uh, and uh, this is something that's a real challenge going forward. So we looked at some population level statistics because we didn't really have access to um, patient level data. So uh, one of the things that uh, we see here again is the uh, Suicide rate among veterans is about three times that for the uh, general population, age 18 and over. But uh, when we look at the rate of suicidality, which is measured as the number of veterans, the prevalence of veterans, of uh, persons who made at least one suicide attempt in the previous 12 months, it's actually higher in the general population than it is for veterans. So this leads us to the question of, well, why are veterans committing suicide in so much higher numbers if they're less likely to be suicidal? And the answer is that veterans are more effective at it. They're actually better at committing suicide than 
So the uh, number needed to harm for veterans is uh, about 11, and it was about 47 for the general population. And um, the uh, numbers in parentheses are just numbers that we got from different analyses, but it doesn't change the overall. So one potential underlying cause we were asked to look at was firearms use, and uh, we found that this actually explains about 80% of the difference, that uh, a veteran is about five times more likely to attempt uh, suicide with a firearm than a member of the general population, and that if veterans uh, used firearms with the same propensity as the general population, that their rate would be about 17 instead of 38, and that's about 80% of the difference. We talked about a, a lot of limitations in our analysis, and the main one is that we just don't have access to granular, timely data about veterans. We don't have patient level records, we often don't have um, records uh, at the state level that talk about veteran suicide in particular. So we really want to address the issue of um, having access to timely, uh, granular data. So that was another question that was asked, and uh, Mike is going to talk a little bit about some approaches to accessing that data. Thank you, Mike. Mike, check. One, two, one, two. There's two mics. <laughs> How many mics do we have in the audience? <laughs> None. I don't believe you guys, but anyway. So my name is Mike Danell, and I'm a, there we go. So my name is Mike Danell, and I'm a undergraduate student studying computational data science at George Mason University. I saw an opportunity walking down the hallways to participate in the Data Lab Challenge, and because I always love a new challenge, I'm a nascent young data scientist, I took up the challenge, not knowing what it was, but wanting to practice my skills. And I really think this is important, that we identify veterans as humans, and we identify that we are not just a number, that we are not weak, and ultimately, when you think about the struggles, and the passion, and the team building, and the family, and the cohesive bonding that occurs, that is what matters. That's what teamwork is, and that's what the Army instills in you. So my background comes from tactical human collections, interrogations, all source analysis, data fusion, targeting, you name it. So I would first off like to thank Bill for GE Digital for really setting up the platform to letting us know that ultimately we can have access to the best technology, which I've had and veterans have access to the best technology, but that can only take us so far. This is about understanding that this is a human problem and we need to, as you think about this as a complex adaptive system, those societies and these cultures, they're built from the ground up. And if we don't have that last mile, if you will, to understand what is truly happening in those communities from the people in those communities, providing peer support, and help and assistance, augmented, of course, by technology and partnerships. So what's the big picture? Forgot to click the slide, but this is the big picture. We can have the best data, but if it's not timely, if it's not granular, if we cannot collect it, if we cannot measure it, this is a problem. When we identify the cohorts of veterans and then we identify the general population, we see that we need more data fusion across lines of communication and coalition partners. That's what makes that's what makes a great team. That's what changes minds. That's what fosters partnerships with the ministries of interiors, with liaisons, with envoys, understanding what's going on. So what do we know about events? When there's a social shock in a community, things bring us together. Super Bowl. We love games. Families love games. They play together, they eat together. We as a nation come together when miracles on ice happen. The hockey team winning for national pride. And also, when we are attacked, when the very core and foundation and identity of our fundamental nature is attacked, we bond together. So what happens to the military? How do they build that bond, that really strong, cohesive team unity? They let you know that you are nothing without the people around you. They break you down. That is how the military breaks down all barriers to race, gender, everything that goes into this very complex topic. 
when we talk about where you're coming from and realizing you are now a team and you will come together and you will come play. Complete the mission. So we had mandatory fun. What's mandatory fun? Well, it's part of the overall team cohesion and building, bonding experience prior to going to war, knowing that these are your fellow soldiers, these are your teammates, and they have families, and we have picnics together, and we drink beer together, and we are friends. This is not a partnership. This is not bound by blood, but by obligation to protect each other and watch out for each other. And we really need to facilitate that successful transition. And how are we gonna do this? Well again, if we don't have kindly, accurate data from human sources, from the community members, how do we identify this? Well, first of all, we can have the interoperable systems. We can have the architecture and everything in place, but ultimately, we need incentives, accountability, and what is the metric by which you measure that? So you need to have a focused perspective. And I think we've come up with a pretty simple solution to a very complex topic, and that's simply identity. Now when we talk of a cap card, the DOD, the Department of Defense, similar to a credit card, has chips in them. And they identify PKI certificates for a central authentication yes. server to know that you are who you say you are. And what happens if you're a soldier and you lose that ID card, nobody knows you. You can't get on base. You can't eat at the chow hall. And what happens when we transition out of the military? Thank you for serving. So the transition process itself fundamentally requires some continuity of identity. As everybody has spoken here, we want to leverage the community. And the community are young veterans now, and we do utilize social media, and we hack mental health through Reddit, through Twitter, through these platforms, and they come together in groups, and they take care of their own, because that's what families do. So when you need to go and get your benefits, if you do have a rapid descent and you don't have a successful transition into your community because you don't speak a common language, you don't understand all the skills, the teamwork, the leadership ability that you build, well, we can foster that. We can remove this burden of proof by allowing veterans to have this identity. By fostering these partnerships that Bill amazingly spoke of, so I don't want to elaborate much on it, but in essence, we need to allow the tagging, the tracking, the locating. And we want to incentivize this with a pretty simple solution, and that's just building real communities. Families, they dine together, they eat together, they cry together, they drink together. And together, we will find each other. Ultimately, what we need is a line of communications, a two-way conversation. We need to have direct access to some mechanism to track our heart rates, to track each other, to know where we are in the community, saying, I'm having a problem, who is, who is available? What resources am I at my disposal? Because there is not a, there is not a shortage of good people wanting to help veterans. And we need to understand that if we can facilitate that, that's where the magic happens. That's where you really get the understanding, well, okay, why, why does Montana, what is this specific area? What are their needs and demands? What's not being met there? And you will never, never get that without the human in the loop. We can augment ourselves. We can be strong, and we can harness the power of the largest family in the world. But this revolves around these principal concepts that we have these pillars, we have these paleolithic emotions, we have these middle eagle institutions in a sense that they have deep roots and that they are not bad, they are just very hard to move. And when you have godlike technology, you have the ability to move at the pace of innovation. And if you facilitate that, I have seen it on the battlefield, the timeliness and accuracy, getting, to the, right, getting the right information to the right people at the right time will save lives. So we hope to see more of this in the future. We appreciate our gracious hosts and the opportunity to present here. 
Phil, Dan, and Claire. And we really hope that over time we can build and foster these partnerships. MBTC does a great job at fostering veteran community initiatives and employment, but we need to do more. We need to bring in the academic and the research so we have access to that data under a common platform. And we can augment the capabilities where the VA is lacking and we can have the metric to track the incentives. You go to the bar with your buddy, if you have two other soldiers and veterans there with you by hosting these community events, you get a free beer. You bring people together in a room just like we are today and problems get solved. People solve problems augmented by technology. Thank you so much. As you can see, I'm not afraid to be bold. I uh, do not have a tie anymore, so. So, uh, uh, quick question. You talked about uh, events bringing people together, like the Super Bowl and 9-11. Uh, and um, yes. Did you have any, uh, did you use data uh, driven analysis to find that, or was that uh, just, uh, you know? No, so we have reporting, we have studies that have been conducted. So in essence, the, the main takeaway that I'm, I'm trying to portray here is when there is social cohesion, when there's an ecosystem of a community, and there's a shock wave through that community, may it be an amazing Super Bowl win because my team won, my home team won. Even if your team didn't win, you can still go and talk to someone and say, you know what, Brady messed that up, or the Eagles you know, did the job. And when we talk about events like Miracle on Ice, right? these are national pride events, that's why the Olympics are held, to show the athleticism and the capabilities of us to compete in a friendly atmosphere. And when we look at events like 7-7, my brothers and sisters in London, and 9-11 here at home, you saw that people come together when needed, that we are strong when we are together, and we have a purpose and a mission so yes, to, sorry, short answer, yes, we, we did examine data, we don't have the granularity, but for example, even a recent article shows that the Puerto Rico uh, crisis with the, with the hurricane, their crisis, their suicide prevention hotline went from 300 to nearly 3,000 in the last couple of months. So basically, when, when you feel abandoned and desperate and in despair, and if no one is helping you, help you get back up. You feel like you're alone. And we need to portray this message to everybody. And I think veterans are the perfect medium because we have that family and that bond that we can put across lines and say, you are not alone. We are one. All right, thank you, Mike. Great, thank you. Um, and I would like to, I know Tom is probably going to mention this at the end, but a reminder that um, the, all the teams are going to be here, and um, so we would invite people to reach out to them um, and ask questions. There were no audience questions allowed here, but to, to ask further questions, um, a lot of them will be over in the exhibit hall. Um, a lot of the, the universities have tables. Um, maybe go find the teams over there, learn more, see more. Um, lots of exciting opportunities to continue hearing about, um, about all of their work. So finally, um, I'd like to introduce the, the last team, which is the team from Virginia Tech. So good morning, everyone. My name is John Park from Virginia Tech. Our team name is Yebigun. Yebigun is a Korean word, which means the reserve of military. So our members are all Yebigun. One of our members, June, was in Hattusa, uh, supporting U.S. Army as a military ambassador. And Bongun was in Army, and Changbang was in Marcos. And I served as an investigator in CSI team in Korean Air Force. I managed, I managed uh, suicide cases, uh, suicide records from all the branches in Korean military, and investigated um, suicide cases in Korean Air Force. So today, I'll talk about the suicide prevention of U.S. veterans. So this is the content of my talk. So first, as an introduction, 
but I'll talk about how they think, how they decided significant problem in U.S. veterans. Then, based on the statistical data, we'll talk about four key factors of veteran suicide, which are education level, family issues, a mental problem, and financial problem. Finally, we'll propose our uh, solution of the veteran suicide. So first of all, I'd like to quickly introduce the suicide rate in a South Korea military. <laughs> so as shown in the graph here, more than 60% of the death in Korean military is caused by suicide. Fortunately, the number is keep, number of suicide is keep decreasing, but still, suicide is one of a big issue in Korean military. However, one interesting factor is that uh, veteran suicide is not a social issue in South Korea. So, as all you know, South Korea and United States is, are in the robot alliance. And uh, since we are sharing the similar issues, my team members are aware of the seriousness of veteran uh, suicide. So we want to approach the veteran suicide problem based on our military experience in Korea. Now let's, let's take a look how crucial the veteran suicide problem is. The graph and the slide shows the suicide rate of veteran and non-veteran per 100,000 lives. So as you can see, veteran suicide rate is extremely higher than non-veteran. In average, it's about 3.6 times higher. Why does this many veterans commit suicide? According to the research, a mental health problem was the leading health-related reason for the veteran suicide. And for the life stress reason, the top factor was related to an intimate partner problem. Furthermore, money-related problems, which includes a quick, a recent crisis, financial problem, and job problem, is the one of main reason for the uh, suicide. Therefore, we chose those four factors of veteran suicide, which are education, family, mental, and financial. The first factor is education level. This slide shows the education attainment of enlisted soldiers and officers. Red bar represents enlisted soldiers and blue bar represents officers. As you can see, most uh, enlisted soldiers have high school degree, but most uh, officers have bachelor's degree or more. And according to the article from The Guardian, uh, the suicide rate of enlisted soldiers is four times higher than the one of officers. And I'll show you one more data supporting this factor. This graph shows the percentage of suicide of veterans by educational level. The percentage of suicide of veterans whose education level is less than bachelor's degree is dramatically high. So from this data, we can determine that the low education level and suicide rate is strongly related and enlisted soldiers have higher risk of committing suicide. The second factor is family issue. Veteran divorce rate is much higher while a marriage person percentage is lower than current military personnel, which signifies that veterans are more likely to get divorced. The reason for veteran divorce includes a military, military family moves a lot and the non-military spouse may have to abandon their career. Such, this such disadvantage um, because difficulty of communication and disconnection from family. This reason can lead unsatisfied mental uh, relations among military families. The graph on the slide shows uh, army couple's mental satisfaction by number of combat deployments. According to the Institute for Family Studies, as the number of combat deployments uh, increases, marital satisfaction decreases. Uh, moreover, Military family relocate to the different different location in two to three years, while civilian moves in every twenty to thirty years. So we can see veterans are more likely to have trouble in trouble uh, with stable <coughs> stable housing, which can lead to unstable family environment. 
Third factor, the third factor is mental problem. According to the uh, Veteran Health Administration, about 580 veterans per 100,000 commit suicide every year because of mental health problems. There are many different types of mental problems such as bipolar disorder, a substance, substance use disorder, depression, and PTSD. Among these causes, we focus on PTSD, which is one of recognized reasons for veteran suicide. PTSD, or post-traumatic uh, stress disorder, is a mental health problem that some people develop there, uh, develop after like experiencing or witnessing a life-threatening uh, event like combat or a natural disaster. So, according to the research of veteran-related organizations, a veteran's PTSD-related suicide rate is much higher than a civilian, as shown on the graph here. This is because the deployed, a deployed troop tend to experience or witness more serious life-threatening events. So, here's one more data about PTSD. So three out of ten individuals who have spent civilian or military time in war zone uh, develop PTSD. According to uh, veteran, veteran Health Administration, the, vet, the veterans who get uh, medical help has three times lower suicide rate than uh, those who don't. However, less than 40% of veterans seek help for their symptoms. And furthermore, veterans have difficulty of keeping their own medical records. Uh, currently, veterans have to manage their own records by themselves to get all the medical support. Uh, here's a short video clip that we interviewed. I'm a retired military myself, and I did 15 years, and the mess up wanted to tell you that any medical information which you go to the doctor or hospital for, please keep those documents. Keep a copy for yourself. It's going to be very um, essential for you to have those once you get out or if anything should happen, like you get hurt or anything, for it's like benefits or whatever. So please keep a copy for yourself. So as I mentioned, veterans are struggle with keeping their medical records uh, themselves to receive the benefits. So last factor is a financial problem. According to the research, the average income of veterans is higher than non-veterans. However, veterans suffer much more financial issues than non-veterans. While, the, for example, while the percentage of non-veterans who has credit card debt is only 34%, 58% of veterans has credit card debt. The main reason for a veteran's debt is mortgage, auto loan. Um, credit card debt, and high unemployment rate. Because many, many veterans are not well planning their discharge, uh, there will be a sudden high cost demanding for this settlement. Moreover, since veterans have compensatory uh, psychology after their duty, they tend to buy excessively without considering their uh, current, uh, current economic situation, economic status. Now I'm going to talk about recommended solution that might help preventing veteran suicide. <coughs> Our first solution is about educational issues. So, re so requirements for enlistment need to be higher. In Korean military, suicide rate of soldiers in army are the highest among all other branches. So this is because anyone can join army easily but for other branches, you have to apply for it and take an like, exam or test. So for example, you need to submit your high school, high school transcript and take an interview. And if you are interviewed, if you want to join uh, Air Force, like you guys probably do. But like what we are trying to say here is that suicide rate of soldiers are related to how much knowledge soldiers have. So providing knowledge with educational seminar or class after work hour will be a great idea as well. If soldiers can learn what they are interested in, it will be very helpful for their future life as a veteran. And finally, uh, support for trans transition to civilian, civilian life in school needs to be more provided. 
Uh, most most schools already have veteran office to support veterans, but it is still hard to uh, hard for veterans to make a transition to civilian life. So creating more veteran related event or community uh, will be really helpful for them. Uh, and as a solution to family issue, we recommend to create a new like new military policies. The first, reducing the number of deployment and increasing duration to stay near family are important. Like for example, giving an option to stay near home around two to three years after deployment will be good to sustain their family uh, relationship. And second solution is to provide extend, extended opportunity to veteran spouse. One in four military spouse are like unemployed or actively seeking jobs. So when this when the spouse holds certification, which are not able to be like certified in another state, spouse would not be willing to relocate with uh, military personnel. So by provide, providing job opportunity inside or near the station and giving a chance to remain in a spouse previous job, family satisfaction could be increased. And here's the solution for mental health problems. As I mentioned before, the, uh, the suicide rate in Korean army keeps decreasing from 2013. And one of the reasons for this was that Korean military reinforced regular personal mental uh, counseling. So therefore, we want to suggest similar methodology. First, we suggest to obligate uh, periodic men personal mental care during the active duty. So this would not only reduce uh, suicide rate during their active duty, but also may veterans be to be familiar with getting personal uh, mental care. Uh, when, and we need to force veterans to visit hospital and receive care at least once a year after they are dismissed. If it is hard for uh, so soldiers to visit hospital, government should provide uh, visiting care services. And one of the reasons veterans dislike to visit hospital is that using military hospital is not easy and comfortable because its processing time is too long and it is hard to make an appointment. So I recommend government allow veterans to use public hospital contracted with the government. So for the financial problem, uh, since current GI bill, GI bill is continuously improving, uh, there are not many issues about a veteran loan itself. However, there is weak policy which can prevent the debt before veterans have. So the government should provide veterans mandatory three months of financial education right after they dismiss. This is uh, because they have tendency to uh, spend their money excessively after they discharge from military. And they have compensatory, uh, compensatory like psychology and big sense in economy. So moreover, it would like to I would like, we would like to recommend to create one-on-one like consultant program during the service and after. So we think there should be a person who can tell veteran you should not buy Mustang for for this situation or something like that. So finally, we want to talk about the mobile application, which is transition by military.com. Uh, it provides a personal uh, personalized approach to the transition process, such as keep tracking important paperwork and uh, searching job for veterans. So it will be really great to encourage uh, veterans to use such this uh, mobile applications. And furthermore, I'd like to suggest to you uh, our concept design of mobile uh, mobile application, which is like we call we care. The first screen is to identify the veteran. And if you register, it'll bring up all your information and match up the best like VA programs. And this is the content of uh, our mobile application. So first application is searching for available hospital based on your location and let you make an appointment easily. And second service is live chat with financial consultant. And third function provides you all the magic benefits as a veteran. And last one is to help you scan and record all the medical and financial uh, papers using your camera. And it will help you easily get your 
like records to receive all your benefits. So, so then for that, the most important thing is that our suggest solution cannot be happened without um, continuous financial support. Then, yeah, thank you for your attention. All right, I'd like to thank all of the teams for their very thoughtful uh, analysis of a very important question. Let's give them a round of applause again. <laughs> uh, I neglected to mention that uh, when I spoke to the VA, uh, they would be happy to hear from the student teams um, concerning uh, their thoughts uh, about this problem. And NBTC has agreed and, and I will commit my time to linking up the student teams uh, to talk to the VA uh, if, if indeed they're interested in doing that, if the student teams are. So they have that opportunity to actually put some of these ideas into uh, real-world practice. We'll see if that happens. I hope it does. So.